page in your uh, chat box as far as how to get to the raffle. And it's a survey. Once you finish the survey, you will enter the raffle to win Mary's book. Even the terrible things seem beautiful to me now. Thank you. So please do the survey and good luck on winning the raffle. Um, I also want to thank all of you who sent in questions. We got a lot of questions from all of you. I don't know that we will be able to get to all of them, but uh, we will sure try. So with all that being said, let's get going. Thank you for joining us tonight, Mary. Oh, thank you for having me, Chris. And thank you to all the people out there on the other side of the screen that I can't see, but really I'm, I'm honored that you're here. <laughs> oh, we're so happy to have you, thank you. Um, actually, I wanna start tonight with one of the questions about a local resident. Uh, you wrote a column a while ago about a Westchester resident who was in your neighborhood taking pictures of buildings. I believe your building in particular. Can you fill us in on that story, please? Well, yes, there was um, a gentleman standing outside. I live in an old Chicago six flat, 19, I'm never sure, 1903, 1906, and uh, a lot of teardowns in my neighborhood. And so I saw him out there taking photos and I eyed him very suspiciously because I figured he was a developer. And I said in a kind of, sort of <laughs> uh, may I help you? And then he explained to me that he had lived in this building as a child and in my, cool. my very place. And so, you know, he came up and looked around and, you know, and then he told me about what the neighborhood used to be. And you know, there used to be a place that sold milk, the old dairy, which just got torn down right across the street. And, uh, it was just one of those serendipitous moments that made this this old kind of falling down place that I live in uh, come to life. It was great. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, that's one of the things we all love about your stories is you bring these Chicago things to life. Um, we do have a question from Allison here. Did you always want to be a journalist and how did you become a journalist? Um, I never wanted to be a journalist until I became one, frankly. Okay. But I did grow up with some desire, you know, it started somewhere in third or fourth grade. I wanted to write, but I didn't really know what that meant, right? What does it mean to write? And, um, I would gravitate, you know, I, I had a little uh, ditto machine. If there are some older people here, they remember ditto machines. When I was in sixth grade, I oh, made yeah. uh, a newspaper for my class on a ditto machine. And then when I was in high school, I wrote for the Phoenix, the Teen Gazette of the Phoenix Gazette newspaper. And I got a little scholarship, which helped me go to college. Um, I worked on the little newspaper at my college Pomona, but I didn't think of it as journalism, you know, it's just, to me, it was writing. And then after mm -hmm, I got out of college, mm -hmm. I worked in college admissions. And honestly, it was my boyfriend at the time who said, you should become a journalist. And I said, what? I don't even read newspapers. They're so boring. And <laughs> I put this idea in my head. And after I'd been out of college for four years, I was living in France and he sent me applications to journalism schools and I filled them out mostly to placate him. And then I got in and then I discovered, oh my God, this is an amazing way to live, to get to go out into the world, to meet people, to try to understand how people work, how places work. And then you get to write. And then somebody prints it and they put your name on it. I mean, you know, it was like a miracle. How cool is that? How cool is that? You started um, your journalistic career in Northern California, correct? Right. At the Peninsula... The Peninsula Times... Times? Tribune. Peninsula Times Tribune back right when... Um, Silicon Valley was just beginning to be Silicon Valley. So this was 1980. And there were these two guys who had started this thing that people were talking about. 
and they had some computers and they called their computers Apple computers. And I covered Cupertino, the planning commission. And I was always writing about how, you know, there were these computer people coming in and tearing up the old orchards and they were, you know, gonna build some computer factory or something. I mean, I look back on that, nobody knew what was happening really, but it was a fantastic, in retrospect, fantastical thing to witness. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Well, obviously you didn't spend your whole time at the Peninsula Times. How did you get to Chicago Tribune? Uh, my editor at the Peninsula Times Tribune uh, went to the Orlando Sentinel to be the editor and he convinced me to move to Orlando. And people said, are you crazy? Why would you leave Palo Alto, California to live in Orlando, Florida? But Orlando was just beginning right. to boom. And okay. it was a great place to be a journalist. It turned out Tribune Company owned the Orlando Sentinel. They also owned the Peninsula. Right. Yeah. And so okay. some editors in Chicago just began seeing my stuff out of Orlando. And one of them called me up one day at my desk at the Orlando Sentinel and said, do you want to come work in Chicago? Yay! It never crossed my mind. I'd never owned a coat. And then suddenly I was in Chicago. It was very cold. <laughs> I, bet. I bet. And you've been here how long now? Well, I came to the Tribune in 1985. And okay. I wrote in the features department for a couple of years. And then I went down to Atlanta for the Tribune. And I was okay. our bureau for five years. And then I came back to write a column in 1992. So a long time. I've gotten old writing in Chicago. Oh, uh, a wonderful time. You've been enjoyed for a long time by a lot of us. Thank you. Um, we're also very curious about your ability to write in so many styles. We had several questions from our patrons regarding your poetry. So combining a couple questions from Joanne and Bonnie, we would love to learn how, how and when you learn to write such wonderful long poems and do you compose them in one session? Well, speaking of that, <laughs> I got up this morning and you know, as some of you know, I've been chronicling the presidency of Donald Trump since he was running for president. And that's actually when I started writing these longish poems. Until, until then, I, had, I would write a poem at the end of the year. And that just started, I don't know, you know, 20 years ago, one end of December, I thought, well, maybe I'll wrap up the year by writing a long poem. And I didn't know how to write a long poem. I've never written, and they're not, I don't think of them as poems. I think of them as doggerel. Um, so I don't, I don't like to elevate them too high to poetry. Um, but there was something about during, you know, the run up to the 2016 election, I just felt moved to write about this in, 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 in rhyme, because I felt there was something mm -hmm. I could do in rhyme, that you could be both incisive, but not harsh in rhyme. And I was looking for that place where you could, you know, you mm -hmm. could boil things down to an essence and make a point. And I got up this morning and I thought, mm -hmm. I'm writing my last Trump poem. So I started at 7.30, I was done by 11.30. And uh, y'all can decide whether that four hours was uh, <laughs> worth anything. So usually I write them, yeah, just in a <laughs> course of the day. That's cool. So you have this, you know, then out. <laughs> um, so getting back to your various styles, um, you write your poetry, you write your column, you write music, um, and you also wrote for Brenda Starr. How did that happen? Well, one of the weirder chapters of my life. Um, the editor that encouraged me to come to Orlando 
he had been golfing one day with the editor of Tribune Media Services, the syndicate that owned Brenda Starr. And that guy was lamenting that they needed a new writer for Brenda Starr. Um, because Dale Messick, who had created it, she drew it and she wrote it. Um, in her latter years, they, they took it away from her. I mean, I think back on that and I just think, wow, that's just really- Wow, that's right. <laughs> to have your creation taken away from you. Yeah. Um, and they had an interim writer who just wasn't working out. So my newspaper editor said, you know, you should talk to Mary Schmeek. And they came to me and I went for an interview. They made me do a sample script. I had no idea how to write a comic script. They gave me some old Winnie Winkles. Some of the, you know. Oh, yeah. That would go to the newspapers, you know, with the dailies printed on them. And I just studied mm -hmm. how it worked. You know, what had to happen in each panel, th you know, three panels Monday, three panels Tuesday, seven panels Sunday. Okay. I made it up and not always all that well, I, I, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> how far in advance did you have to write those? Oh, you know, in the beginning I wrote in advance, but because I was, you know, a full-time newspaper reporter and traveling correspondent, I mean, it got, it got really tough there because I was traveling around doing my correspondent things. And I, I remember during the trial of the televangelist Jim Baker. This is one of the worst. Mm -hmm. At the breaks in the Charlotte, North Carolina courthouse, I was sitting there writing the next week's Brenda Starr during the break, sitting there in longhand on yellow legal pad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I'm not the only procrastinator. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> well, I think of it as time you know, it's just oh, the things when they need to be done. I think it was just like working in the back of your mind, right? That's all. That's, right. all. That's what I say, right? Um, we have a question now from Alyssa. Uh, does your writing process change depending on your project, such as a column versus the comic strip or writing your song for your annual sing-along or uh, yes, you know, mostly I write columns now and mostly columns are 700 to 900 words. Um, some of those okay. are opinion, but some of those are stories. So, you know, mm. if, if I'm writing an opinion, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll read what I need to read to feel that I have an informed opinion and I'll make notes. Um, if I'm doing a story, then, you know, I'll call people or I'll go out on the story and I'll interview them and, you know, and then I'll come back and begin to assemble. So that, that's a different, a different process. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do much longer stories and that's a whole other process of reporting and assembling um, and self-editing. So... Mm -hmm. I'm sure verifying all of your details. Yeah. So, you know, fact checking is a huge thing. Even when you're writing opinion, you know, you have to make sure that the names are spelled right and the facts that you're building your opinion on are right. Did that answer? Oh, we have. That's a, that's a, that's a vast question, right? And hard to answer. It is vast. <laughs> Much more than could be, yeah, than an hour would uh, take to answer. Uh, we had a question just pop up in our chat, wondering what the uh, sing-along was about. Um, I love that, your time with Eric Zorn. Could you um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so did you by any chance come to our virtual sing-along this, this year? I was unable to, unfortunately. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but... Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> so, so songs of good cheer is a holiday sing-along that my Tribune colleague Eric Zorn and I started uh, 21 years ago. I had written a column about how nobody sang 
Christmas carols anymore. And Eric came to me and he said, well, let's do it. Let's put on a show with the Old Town School of Folk Music. And I thought, are you crazy? Um, <laughs> he goes, well, you play the piano, I play the guitar. I said, oh, we don't play well enough to, you know, play the <laughs> show. So he recruited some great musicians from the Old Town School. And we put together a holiday program and we thought we would do it just once. And the demand for it, even that year was so strong, we did two. And people said, were well, you gonna do it next year? And we went, okay. And then just every year it built until we, past few years have done six shows and you know, all, all of them sell out and it's become this tradition for many people. Um, this year, we, um, there was a pandemic and we thought, what the heck? There was. We gonna do? <laughs> yes, you heard there was a pandemic. <laughs> um, so we thought we might have to just give it up for the year, but we figured out a way to do it virtually. And it turned out to be wonderful, really wonderful. Fabulous. Are we able to view that? Um, is it like on so, YouTube? Yeah, it's still, um, I just want to make sure nobody from you is, somebody's tech me, but it's not you, right? No. Nope. Um, yeah, it's still online somewhere. Um, you know, there was a charge for it initially, but it's still floating out there on YouTube. If somebody wants to go find it, I suspect you could find it by putting in songs of good cheer on YouTube. Everybody do that after the show. I guarantee it'll be fun. Um, okay, moving on, <laughs> moving on to another question. Um, this one's another one about your writing. Uh, what's a typical writing schedule for you, or if there is even such a thing, in terms of submissions each week, uh, since online postings have become part of your job, in addition to the print edition column schedule? Did I say that correctly? <laughs> yeah, so I write, I, I write um, three columns a week. And my deadline is 5.30 p.m. on Wednesdays, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So on those days, those are my like, get up and really focus days. Mondays and Wednesdays, I generally, I think about what I'm gonna write and maybe I'll go out and report something, you know, maybe I'll begin to gather string or I answer a lot of email and stuff. But on the days I write, you know, I get up and I just start fretting about it, thinking about it. Some days the idea comes early and easy. Some days, you know, I have what I tell my editors is my 1 p.m. idea. <laughs> if an editor asks right. me at 10, what are you writing about? I'll tell them if I know, and then I'll say, well, I'm not sure. And then at one, I may, you know, write and say, okay, this is my 1 p.m. bottom of the barrel idea. Um, but sometimes those are the ones that really resonate. One the other day, which was a 1 p.m. idea, which was missing going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I got so much reaction to that because, you know, it wasn't politics, it wasn't COVID, it was just... A lot of us yeah. miss going to the gym. A lot of us, myself included. I miss my swimming pool. Yeah. Um, oh, going back to your Brenda Starr days, we have a question from Susan. When you wrote Brenda Starr, did you work from galley drawings? Or how'd you do that? Um, well, since I wrote Brenda and didn't draw her, the way that works this is the script comes first and then the writer sends it to the artist. So Dale Messick, who invented this, she did both. Okay. Um, but even with her, I imagine the, the writing came first. You have to know what the story is before you can draw it, right? So I would say- sounds right. A script, you know, with, with Every single panel, you know, Monday, panel one, 
And then I would describe what Brenda or whoever else mm -hmm. was doing. And then I would, you know, stipulate exactly what each person was saying and do this panel by panel and then send that to the artist. And I work okay. with two fantastic artists who, you know, I had to learn to think visually. That was, that was an interesting aspect of learning to do this mm -hmm. because, you know, the woman who did it briefly before me, she'd been in television. She thought okay. visually, but she couldn't think statically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, I had to learn to think what can actually happen in one panel and then, yeah. and how do you move to the next panel and not give the artist too much to do. Um, so it was very interesting to, to learn, you know, to figure that out and then to see your words be drawn by someone, Ramona Fraden and later June Brigman, you know, just fantastic artists. That's impressive, Mary, that you could switch your mind thought to being able to think that way. I mean, I'm sure there are people that go to years and years of school to be able to figure out that process. Well, Yet, well uh, most people would never even have to think about it because, <laughs> I mean, it never occurred to me I would draw, uh, write a comic strip, right? It's just, it is not a form of thinking that any of us has ever been asked to do. No, right. <laughs> Well, you did it well. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh boy, we're going back to your writing style again. Do you have, this is from Mary Beth. Do you have a favorite genre that you like to write in? Or even that you like to read? How about that? You know, I just, I, I like it all. I mean, mostly, you know, tell me a story. I am more of a storyteller than an arguer. I prefer stories in general to arguments. Sometimes that's problematic for me as a columnist, um, yes. but, but I like story and I like characters yeah. and the way I like to read, what I like to read and the way that comes most naturally for me to write is through story. This happened, mm -hmm. and then this happened, and then you wondered, oh, what would happen next? And then that right. happened. So I prefer fiction to nonfiction, but if you give me a really good nonfiction book and the story mm -hmm. works, I like that. Okay. You know who to ask. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so some of those stories that you um, so beautifully told were about growing up and how, how life was growing up in a big family, um, particular stories about your mother, particular stories about your father. Um, were they all okay with you writing about them? You know, when I started writing about my family, mostly about my mother originally, um, it never occurred to me to ask her. My mother was such a benevolent soul and she just always, you know, she trusted me and loved that I wrote for a newspaper. If she had been born in a different time, she would have been a writer. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. Think I intuited that she would be okay with my writing mm -hmm. about her. And then once she yeah. figured out that's what I was doing, she always said she was okay. Um, Good. I think looking back that I might have asked her, you know, that, that, that now I have a, a somewhat different sensibility about how much it's okay to take of other people's lives, even if you're thinking of it as your own life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never have written as openly about my father as I have if he were alive. Yeah. 
um, because he was a much more problematic person. Okay. Than my Understood. Mother. Yeah. But yeah. Um, my, my siblings have always seemed fine with it, but it is an interesting question. You know, I think a lot of writers, um, you write, you think you're writing about your own life, mm -hmm. but you're also writing about other people's lives. And, yes. you know, I, I think I have learned to be more careful through the years about yeah. the way I've drawn in other people's lives into my writing about myself. Sure, sure. I get that. Um, so going back to your days in Georgia, did that have a lot of influence on your writing today, the style or the voices you hear, that kind of thing? You're cutting out on me there. So growing up in Georgia. Okay, now you're back. You were gone for a moment there. Yeah. It's okay. No, I'm right here. <laughs> um, did the, did you, growing up in Georgia, your Southern style, um, did that affect um, the way you wrote or the voices that you heard, um, some of the topics that you, did, you wrote about? I'm sure it did now that I yeah, asked the I'm, question. I'm sure I'm like, it did. <laughs> You know, I've thought about this periodically. I think it affected me in several ways. Uh -huh. um, the South is a storytelling culture. Yes, it is. It's a, it's an oral culture, you know, mm -hmm. um, and there were just words and stories around. I think that affected me. Um, I think we left the South when I was 14. Oh, okay. I went to Arizona and then I went to California. So you know, I was gone from there for a long time. And then when I came back to Chicago and the Tribune sent me to the South to cover the South, mm -hmm. that was when I really came to understand where I'd grown up. And the time oh. I had grown up. Uh -huh. I went there as someone who was long gone, reporting on it for a northern newspaper. Wow, yeah. And it really opened my eyes to the place I'd grown up. You know, as a child, you don't see it. No, you don't. No. And, and I think even more importantly, when I came back to Chicago to write a column. Mm -hmm. I think those years that I spent, not only growing up in the South, but writing about the South for the Tribune, made me see Chicago in a way that a lot of native Chicagoans do not see it. Mm -hmm. I felt mm -hmm. very drawn to African-American neighborhoods because I felt that mm -hmm the long chain of history there, right? I understood that Chicago's African-American neighborhoods were rooted in the South mm -hmm. and the very complex set of things that meant. And I discovered that a lot of Chicago people didn't understand that. They didn't understand how Southern, Black Southern, but also Southern, mm -hmm many Chicago neighborhoods were. Interesting, yeah. You know, especially in the 80s, you know, and then the, in the 90s when I got here, I mean, there were a lot of older people in on the west side and the south side who had grown up in Mississippi and Alabama. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, they had a certain relationship to the church. A Absolutely. To the land, mm -hmm. which was different. Yeah. So yeah. You know, that's a that's a set of stuff. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm I'm sure it was eye opening to uh, to figure that all out here. Um, 
Let's see how, let's switch gears a little bit. Well, not quite so much. We have a question from Megan, who is a teacher. And she would like to know what advice you would give to her to get kids interested in writing. That is a great question, Megan. Um, what, level, yes, it is. <laughs> what level of kids are we talking about? That I don't know. Elementary school. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean. I, well, how about we address them all? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have a tidy answer. Um, I, I do think that asking kids to write about stuff that happens in their family or with their friends is one way to get them to write so that it's not abstract. Um, Good point. You know, the first essay I remember writing was an assignment where we had to write about something strange or funny that happened in our house. and I wrote something about how my brothers had taken all the fuses out of the fuse box I had five (laughs) and I called it fuse confusion and I remember that was the moment where a little light bulb went off for me it's like oh interesting this is how it works um there's a teacher there's a high school teacher who has written me several times to tell me a thing that he does with his, I think they're sophomores, maybe they're freshmen, uh, that he has discovered works really well. I often do a thing in my column called Nine Things I Like. Mm -hmm. And I take these nine things and I'll write a couple of paragraphs on each thing. And he's been using that technique and he says it really gets some interesting responses and it gets them to write. So they don't have to Love write it. super long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's personal. So, you know, there's a, a level of writing that goes beyond the personal and then when you're getting to structure and et cetera, et cetera. But if you're just trying to get people to write something down, asking them to tell you something that they know about someone they know, about something they like. Mm -hmm. Very good advice. Make it personal. Good luck. Well, (laughs) good luck. Good luck. I have to say, um, your articles are quite personal sometimes, and they really hit home with me a lot of them, and I'm sure they do with your readers. Um, You've made me laugh out loud, belly laugh. You've made me cry. So um, we did have one person here asking, um, where do you get your ideas from? Um, Is it something that's assigned to you, sometimes assigned to you? Do you come up with them on your own? Do they develop? How does that work? Uh, Nothing is assigned to me. There are some days when I wake up and I just think, oh, please tell me what to do. Please tell me what to write. (laughs) Don't make me think this up all on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the first thing I do is I look at the news and I I just think, okay, what is bubbling up in the news? Do I have anything to say about this that A, might be interesting Mm -hmm. be that I can think out in the time that I have, you know, sometimes there are things in the news that are really interesting, but they are really complicated. Yeah. And I just can't think them out. I can't report them out that fast. And then can they fit into 750 words? Right. So, you know, that is, that is a complex set of stuff. It's like, you know, somebody will write and say, well, why don't you write about this? And I will say, well, I would if I had four weeks to report it and a thousand or 2000 words to write it. Um, right. So if the news fails, then I, I ask myself, well, what am I really thinking about? Mm-hmm. As opposed to what should I be thinking about? 
you know, so again, to so, cite a very small column, but missing the gym. Yeah. You know, when the news was not supplying me, I just thought, well, you know, I've been hanging on to this thought for a dry day and I'm just going to write about missing the gym. Sometimes so tell us, do you have, write, uh, tell me, you know, will tell me about a good story. Most of the time when people write to suggest a story, it's not quite a story for me. Mm -hmm. um, but every now and then it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. I love yeah. that. But you can tell it in your writing. It comes through. Um, so tell us, do you have uh, one or two columns tucked away for those times when you totally go brain dead? Or do you really work on it to get them each time fresh? I, I don't have what, you know, evergreens or people will say in the can. That's a, that's right. a newspaper. Yeah. You have something in the you can? Don't have... No, I have not <laughs> in the can. <laughs> Oh, cool. Um, we have another question for you about the Tribune. Did you have a mentor at the Tribune? Um, no, I've never really had a mentor at the okay. Tribune. My first Unforgettable co-workers? Oh, oh my co-workers. Oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, my, my yeah. first paper editor at the Peninsula Times Tribune and at the Orlando Sentinel, uh, a guy named Dave Bergen. He was unbelievably influential on my life as a writer. Oh, I wonder. Because he believed in me from the get-go. He threw me into situations and just said, go get them. And then mostly said yay and every now and then he would go what and then he would tell <laughs> me what was wrong with it and he would be right um so yeah he really changed my life fabulous fabulous um do the other writers at the tribune ever offer suggestions about what to write about um not very often i mean every now and then one of my colleagues will you know, send me a note and say, you know, have you thought about writing about this? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, do your readers give you much feedback on your columns? Oh, <laughs> oh there was, <laughs> there was almost enough said, Mary. <laughs> yes, and here's, I love to hear from readers who have something nice or reasonable to say. I mean, that is one of the great parts of my, my work is that I sure it is connection with people. But, you know, especially in the past four years, there's just so much animus, animosity out there. Yeah. And people, all columnists get this almost regardless of what you write, but um, people feel free to park all of their and vitriol and to do it in the crudest ways. And that is really difficult every day to see, you know, along with all the wonderful stuff. Don't, don't, don't get yeah. me wrong, you know, yeah. hearing from people who are not ugly. There's so much ugliness and people are just looking. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. So speaking of um, difficult things, um, do you have one particular story that was really hard to write for you? Um, there are a couple that come to mind. The more recent one involves a, a, a boy named Tavon Tanner. Tavon was shot on his front porch in the summer of 2016. And my editors had asked me, there were, so there were a lot of kids shot that summer. And my editor mm -hmm. 
asked me if I would figure out a way. They rarely ask me to do anything, but they asked me to do this. If I would figure out a way to write yeah. the children who were being shot in Chicago. Yeah. And, you know, I explored a variety of ways to approach this. And then I connected with Tavon's mother, Melanie Washington, a wonderful, wonderful woman. Yeah. And embarked on trying to tell the story. And I, you know, this was a story that I almost hate to call it a story because it's their lives, right? I don't like yeah. story. Um, but I got connected with them and over a period of months, along with our photographer, Jason Lambscans, um, you know, we were with them, with Tavon in the hospital. He was getting, you know, surgery and hoping to have the bullet removed. And when he went back to school and it's very tricky to walk into someone's life and say, let me be there at these most emotional, mm -hmm. complicated moments in your life. And please trust me. And once you've yeah. said, please trust you have to be trustworthy. Absolutely. And that is more complicated than it sounds because you want to make sure that you're not reflexively doing something for journalistic reasons mm -hmm. that somehow takes advantage of someone, you know? Yeah. So, so, you know, I was just always questioning, 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 questioning myself. You know? yeah. And, you know, I think it came out okay because every year, you know, Jason and I go back and we, we see Tavon and his mom and we've written a story every year since. And, you know, I text with his mother occasionally. And, but I'm very aware of this fine balance. You want to tell a true story. Absolutely. But you need to honor the people, the lives whose story you're telling. So you broke up a touch there. You were talking about you need to honor. Oh, you need to honor the the, the, the people, the whose stories you're telling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're dealing with, you know, a serial killer. Slightly, slightly different. Though even there, even there, you know, people are people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, so so after writing a story like that, um, I would have to find some way of bringing myself back to some manner of being comfortable. How do you get comfortable? I know you do yoga. Is there anything else you do to try and ease the, the pain and the tension and the stress and all that? Uh, yoga, yoga helps. Um, I play my piano, which you can see behind me. You mentioned Love your piano. Um, you know, moving, music, having good friends, close family, all of that, regardless of what the stress is, helps me hugely. Good, good. Glad to hear it. Well, I've heard from um, a birdie that at some point in your life, you were a professional barrel house and ragtime piano player. <laughs> you knew it would come out. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, I have no idea why that is on Wikipedia. <laughs> because I have never played barrel house piano. Uh, I can play a little bit of ragtime. I think this must come because it's somewhere sometime I must have said, that when I was in high school, I took piano lessons from a barroom piano player, and I did. Uh -huh. 
Uh -huh. and, you know, his name was Art Fine. He was a very fine barroom piano player. Uh, and he taught me how to play the piano, basically. Okay. And so, you know, I am the kind of piano player that, you know, I, I, I joke about myself as a barroom piano player, but okay. it's, I've been paid to play in bars, right? <laughs> but if people are at a party and they've had a little to drink and there's a piano, I'll play and people will sing along. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. So it's just an urban folk tale. How about that? Um, so a question has popped up from Pat. Uh, in one of your articles, you wrote, a, or one of your um, columns, uh, you wrote about do one thing each day that scares you. Uh, do you still abide by your own advice? <laughs> I don't always consciously abide by my own advice, though I do keep that idea in mind that just because something scares me doesn't mean I shouldn't do it, right? You know, I right. mean, I'm always making the calculation of, oof, you know, can I, can I take a deep breath and do this thing that scares me? Um, uh huh. Every time I write, it scares me. So. Does it still? Terrifies me. Terrifies me. Huh. So at least three times a week, <laughs> follow my. <laughs> So what about it terrifies you? The deadline, the topic? Um, um, or are we delving too, uh, too deep here? <laughs> no, there's always, you know, I, I, I still get up many, many days and I think I can't do this. I don't know what I'm going to say. So I'm afraid of not knowing what to say, of not finding a thing to say. And You know, I'm not exactly afraid of the reaction. It's not afraid of the reaction. Mm -hmm. But I do get tired sometimes anticipating the ugliness that will come at me. Oh, sure. Almost regardless. You can write about missing the gym. And there will be people who write you nasty emails. I'm not kidding. <laughs> That's terrible. It's just, and so, so, you know, there is, there is this twitchiness in me. It's like, oh my God, if I choose the wrong word, people will fixate on a word. Yeah. And then you'll think, oh yeah, I guess I could have chosen a better word, but I'll talk dead a lot. <laughs> right. Right. Oh my gosh. Um, so with all these columns have you, that you've written, have you ever been afraid for your own safety because of something you've written about? Um, I have periodically during our last presidential regime received uh -huh. emails that concerned me some, you know, afraid, mm, uh, you know, I got one just a few days ago from, you know, someone who said, I'm not threatening you. But, yeah. and then went on to say, you know, you better be careful what you say. And it's like, mm. wow. So, again, I, you know, there are columnists who get more of that than I do. Well, um, I'm sorry to hear that they do that. Um, so we had another question here about your music. So we have a question from Peggy. She says, I know you, I know about Gotta Sing, but you have you written other songs too? Um, well, hi Peggy, and thanks for mentioning Gonna Sing. So Gonna Sing is a song I wrote for songs that could cheer. Um, I, you know, I used to write songs all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't write them very often anymore. I don't know why, but uh, Gonna Sing is my only publicly performed song. <laughs> and that's because I am good musicians who would perform it because I'm not really. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, let's see. 
Um, what other questions we have? Um, so you've answered what one of the hardest articles to write was. Do you have some more fun ones that you really enjoyed writing and wish would happen more, more often? A particular type or a particular column you recall? Well, I'll tell you the, the one that popped my mind first when mm -hmm. you said that was a couple of years ago, I wrote a column about my first winter coat when I came to Chicago and, 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 and how I didn't, it took me 10 years to figure out what a proper winter coat was in Chicago. And <laughs> that was one of those columns, that was a 1 p.m. column where I just thought, oh, I'm just gonna write this silly column about you know how when you move to Chicago from somewhere else, you do not know what a winter coat is. And you go through many wrong winter coats before you get to the right. That thing went viral, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was just, I mean, that was pure fun. I'm sure I got some ugly email on that too. You know, what's wrong with you? You can't, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I love just writing the fun ones, but the problem is when you write just the fun ones, people will write and say, with all the problems in the world, you're writing about winter coats or the gym or. <laughs> right. Can't please them all, all the time, can you? I love just the fun ones though. So it's um, like, like your sunscreen, wear sunscreen. Talk about going viral. It even has a song written to it. That's pretty yeah. cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and that was just a fun one. That was just a, it's Friday. I got nothing to write about. Uh, I'll just pretend to write a graduation speech. Yeah, and it ended up as a book. Yeah. <laughs> um, very good advice, by the way, thank you. <laughs> So I have another question here. Um, what was your reaction to winning the Pulitzer for commentary? Were you even aware you were in the running? That's a good one. Um, I did know that my editors had nominated me. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, the odds of winning are so small <laughs> that, um, It was a complicated uh, thing for me because on the one hand, great. I would never say I wasn't happy to win that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, but I was 58 years old when I won it. So I had some measure of the world, the measure of what that prize means in the context of a whole life, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my brother Bill was dying at the time and the thing that I remember most about that moment and about that day was feeling this is so wrong mm. that my brother is dying and I'm getting this accolade mm -hmm. and yet he was thrilled for me Nobody, I'm sure he was. No one was happier than Bill. Yeah. But, but it was all, you know, pe people think that something like that is all unalloyed joy and riding the cloud. And um, again, I'm glad I got it. I'm glad I have it. But I understand what it is and what it isn't. It's a thing. It's just a thing. Well, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. It's a very good thing thing. And uh, do you know where it is right now? The actual uh, prize? You know, I am not sure. It might be tucked in a cubby hole in that little hutch there. <laughs> uh, I don't keep it out. I you know why. That doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> um, so can you tell us a little bit about the ice cream man story? I love that one. Um, that was a story I wrote about um, when I was 
fourth, fifth grade. Um, my dad was out of work. Has happened more than once in my growing up. And we were truly broke. I mean, not kind of like, kind of broke. We were really broke. Church gave us food. That's how broke we were. Um, and I, you know, the ice cream man was out front and I just wanted a nutty buddy. I just, I wanted a nutty buddy so bad. And I went down and I, my dad, who was home because he was out of work. My dad was a super hard worker. He hated mm -hmm. work. And he was watching some show on TV. And I said, dad, can I have some money for the ice cream man? And I had screwed up my courage for this, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, The short version of it is, you know, I knew he was going to tell me no. And then I screamed something about, I hate being poor. And he told me, you know, Mary Teresa, he got really mad. When, when he got mad, he would use my full name, Mary Teresa. We are not poor. We may not have money, but we are not poor. And, you know, and he reached into his pocket and pulled out some change. And he said, you know, and while you're at it, get your brothers an ice cream too. Actually, he gave me the little lecture after he'd given me the money, you know, as I was hustling <laughs> the ice cream man. And that's when he stopped me, Mary Teresa. We are not poor. Oh, and it just, you know, that was the, the point of that column was. You know, when I look back on that, I just think about it. he gave me he didn't really have money to give. Yeah. And the yeah. there is that, you know, no matter how little you have, you probably have something, something. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about profound poverty here now, but I just, for all of us, yeah. you've got nothing to give, but maybe you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we're running out of time here. I'm going to ask you if you have a special story you'd like to share with us before we close down for the evening. A special story about... About you and your girlfriend when you went to France or about... <laughs> Uh, that story that's too long <laughs> yeah that's a good one though uh, let's, see. Um, let's see what are some other really good ones um, I really like this is a, a sad one this shouldn't be the one we end the evening on but your uh, Joan Lefkow series was so remarkable and so moving and so special and it really gave us insight into not only her life, but how one incident, one thing that she did for her job, and she lost so much, not only family members, her home, but her privacy. Um, it yeah, was so beautifully John written. John was a federal judge who's, um, husband and mother were murdered in her home. Uh, in 2005, I think. Um, and that was when I said there were two stories when you asked me about stories that have been hard to do. Yeah. That was, that, that was the other one. And Joan is just one of the most remarkable women, people I've ever met. So kind, so generous. Um, we took a walk this summer. It was really Aww. Aww. And um, you know, I will say just you know as a final a final note here that one of the great privileges of my life, my life as a writer, as a reporter at the Chicago Tribune 
is being able to meet people like Joan Lefko and Tavon Tanner and his mother and and being able to know them and tell their stories. Again, I hate reducing lives to stories. Um, and to feel that there are people who read the Tribune who know how to receive those stories in some meaningful way and that these stories help connect us as a place, as a community. And when I think about the threat to newspapers, local journalism, that's one of the things I think about is under threat, is these stories. Journalism is not just politics. It's not just argument over politics. It's the stories of human beings that help us know, you know who we are and where we are. Well, thank you so much for bringing those stories to us. And uh, all of Chicago appreciates your work. We hope you continue for a long, long time. We have one patron, Peggy again, who says, thank you, Mary, your moral center is amazing. And I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all uh, to all of you who are here this evening and all of you who read and support the Chicago Tribune. It, you know, it means a lot, not just to me and my colleagues, but to our larger place. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you much. <laughs>